Hello friends, Dr. David Katz, another COVID reality check. And this one I think is the most fundamental of them all because this is just basic math. And if you do the right basic math and put reasonable numbers into your equations, nothing but truth and fact issues out. And I think that can offer us a lot of perspective on the COVID pandemic. The, the best way for us to know what's going on the, what are the risks? Who's at risk? How much risk? Hospitalization, complications, death. Would be a massive level of testing. We failed to achieve at the start and show no signs of achieving anytime soon. And in the absence of population level testing, the next best thing would be representative random sampling. You could test many, many fewer people and still get the same basic insights. And what we want to know is who's infected now, who has been infected, who's recovered from this, who has immunity, who has immunity represented by IgG, who has immunity represented by memory T cells, who has immunity represented, represented by IgA, who had native resistance because their T cells were reactive to common cold coronaviruses. And out of those denominators, then how many wound up being hospitalized how many wound up with complications, how many wound up dying. Because you really can't make any sense of rates, a fatality rate, for example, if you don't know the denominator. We've never known the denominator. So this reality check is about correcting that problem with the available data. The next best thing to population level data is data from research that gives you insights into what's going on into populations and then applying the right math. And, and I'll show you what I mean. We have zero prevalence studies, studies that look at the levels of antibodies formed in the United States that indicate quite consistently we've had 10 times more infections than we've managed to document with testing. So that would mean we haven't had 6.5 million cases of coronavirus infection in the United States we've had 65 million. I think that's true. The, the seroprevalence studies consistently point at an order of magnitude more infections. I think that's true not just because of the consistency of that research, but for this very important reason. If you reach the same mathematical conclusion with two completely independent models, that conclusion becomes significantly more robust, and that's just what happens here. The other model is this. Studies from all around the world consistently suggest that the infection fatality rate for COVID is 0.3%. The latest study to suggest that is a major uh, research effort out of Iceland published in the New England Journal of Medicine, again reaffirming total infection fatality rate at the population level of 0.3%. And by the way, for those under age 70, 0.1%, which is very comparable to seasonal flu. We have had, as I record this, roughly 200,000 deaths from COVID or attributed to COVID in the United States. And, and by the way, if you have been touched personally, by any of those, as, as I have, if your family has suffered a loss, my heartfelt condolences. What, what does statistics mean to you, right? It, it, it's a personal loss. The numbers don't matter, and I'm just sorry. And, and I've experienced that too. I know what it feels like, and, and you know who cares about numbers at that point. But to understand the pandemic itself, we have to talk about numbers, so forgive me. I'm well aware that, that talking about numbers and data obscures the real people and the real losses and, and the real sorrow that hides behind that veil. So again, my condolences, and we just have to talk about numbers to understand the big picture. So we've had 200,000 deaths attributed to COVID in this country. If the infection fatality rate consistently around the world is 0.3%, what does it mean if 200,000 deaths is 0.3% of the total infected? In other words, 0.3% of what equals 200,000? That's math. That's algebra. And the answer is 67 million. 
So if we simply take seroprevalence findings that indicate we've had 10 times more infections in the United States than we've documented, our conclusion is not 6.5 million cases, but 65 million cases. If instead we use infection fatality rate data from all around the world and apply that to the total number of deaths in the U.S., we get 67 million. These numbers are the same, but for rounding. And they indicate that that is the truth. Two completely independent mathematical equations leading to the same conclusion. And by the way, this is the low end of those that have been infected because the seroprevalence studies, for the most part, only identify immunity by lasting IgG. There is evidence in the published literature showing that even people who've had significant symptomatic infections don't always make IgG, and people who've had mild and asymptomatic infections almost never do. So we're actually missing a lot of the cases even in the seroprevalence studies. And then there's one additional consideration. All of this is only about the infection fatality rate, or IFR. That's the number who have died out of the total number infected. But we know that roughly half of people exposed don't get infected with SARS-CoV-2 because they do have prior native resistance due to exposure to common cold coronaviruses. That roughly half is an estimate. The range actually goes from a low end of about 30 or 40 percent to a high end of 80 to 90 percent. So 50 percent who get exposed but don't get infected is about middle of the road. In a column that I will append to this video below it, on this same topic, math as the penultimate pandemic reality check. Again, population level data would be the ultimate reality check. Math with the data we have is the penultimate pandemic reality check. So in the column, which is a lengthy read, I forewarn you, uh, I do all these calculations. I show all the sources and um, I provide the uh, references to, to show you, a hyperlink to the references showing uh, where these ranges come from, these estimates about the numbers uh, who recover from infection but don't make antibodies, uh, the numbers who are exposed to SARS-CoV-2 but don't get infected. When you do all this very simple math, the conclusion is that minimally we've had 65 to 75 million cases of uh, COVID in the United States. And what that means is the, the infection fatality rate, the complication rate, the hospitalization rate, all of those rates are an order of magnitude less than they appear to be because 10 times more people are in the denominator. But that's the low end of the increase in the denominator because if we adjust for people who develop immunity but don't make IgG. And if we double the denominator because half of people meaningfully exposed to SARS-CoV-2 don't get infected in the first place, well, that further changes uh, all of our estimates and actually generates infection fatality rate and meaningful exposure fatality rates that are massively lower than what they appear to be. None of this is a reason to stop respecting SARS-CoV-2. Again, it has killed 200,000 uh, of our, our fellow uh, citizens and in some cases members of, of our families. Uh, so we all know we should respect it. I've been to the front lines. I've seen how devastating the infection can be. But we really need to combine a respect for the virus with a respect for the fallout of lockdown. And, and one other thing I address in the column, Sweden has had a total of about 5,000 deaths without lockdown out of a population of 10 million. That's a lower death rate per million population by a considerable margin than the United States. So even with our lockdown, we've had a higher total fatality rate relative to the population than Sweden, um, showing how poorly uh, we have done at protecting the most vulnerable. Sweden apparently did better. Uh, the other issue, of course, is we may just be less healthy to begin with, and that's been another theme in these videos. 
a lot of our vulnerability to adverse outcomes from COVID is mediated by the bad health Americans brought into this pandemic. We basically already had epidemics of hypertension, obesity, type 2 diabetes, coronary disease, the leading risk factors for adverse COVID outcomes. And the good news there is these are modifiable risk factors. And by fixing them, in particular with lifestyle, improving diet, improving activity levels, uh, but fixing them any which way we can, we immediately protect ourselves against adverse COVID outcomes, but are also contributing to better health over the long run. All right, so I'll leave it there. This is, uh, again, I think the, the, the most definitive of these reality checks because it's math. And to whatever extent, I don't cover all the details in the video, please check out the column that's appended below along with a couple of other relevant links. And my intent here is to help us all get a grip on the situational reality. And uh, frankly, uh, I need a little bit of a break from both living through the pandemic and trying to make sense of it all the time. And I'm going to take one. Uh, so f until I see you on the flip side, uh, I leave the matter in your hands.